It's been a tumultuous year for South America. Right-wing populism has taken root in Brazil while the Amazon rainforest burns. The ousting of Bolivia's first indigenous president has stoked controversy and protest. Meanwhile, Venezuelans continue to suffer, caught between a faltering regime and an interventionist U.S. policy that seems more interested in the country's oil than its people. The Real News has been on the ground covering all these important stories in the region and more. As we approach the end of 2019, we thought it would be helpful to review what has happened and what will happen next in one of the most critical areas in the world. It's part of a series of year-end reviews we will be producing on critical topics we have covered throughout the year. Latin America, Israel-Palestine, the climate crisis, U.S. politics, and of course, my beat, criminal justice system reform. To begin this review, I'm joined by our Real News editor and resident expert on South America, Greg Wolpert, who's been reporting on Latin America for 20 years. Greg, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. So let's first go from the general to the specific. What do you see as the main trends in Latin America in 2019? I think there are four main trends uh, that uh, were taking place in this year. The first one is that the rightward drift of the governments in the region has continued. That is a drift that began already in, uh, with the election of Mauricio Macri in Argentina in 2015 and has it been accelerating really. And in this year, in 2019, there were three more countries that joined the ranks of uh, conservative or right-wing governments. So you could actually say that there's now a total of 16 conservative or right-wing governments in Latin America. So that's the first major trend, uh, a continuation basically of one that had been long established. The second one, which is actually quite new, is um, that there's been a wave of popular uprisings of uh, protest movements, particularly against neoliberal policies throughout Latin America. This had, took place in four main countries, in Chile, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, and Haiti. Uh, and uh, we can go into details as to exactly why that happened, but uh, that's really the, the main trend that's relatively new. I mean, we've seen these kinds of protest movements in the past, particularly in the period of the early 2000s, uh, but they've made a really strong comeback this year. Then the third trend is uh, that there were also a couple of protest movements uh, that are more conservative in nature and were directed against uh, leftist governments. And here I'm particularly thinking of the movements that took place against the government of Evo Morales mm -hmm. and against the government of uh, Nicolas Maduro in, uh, in Venezuela. Uh, so, and again, I want to get into greater detail to explain those, but um, that was also an important new development, relatively speaking. And then finally, uh, there were two exceptions to these other trends, um, so it makes it for, I guess, a relatively messy picture, uh, which is that actually left-wing governments did win two elections, and uh, one was particularly in Argentina relatively recently, and then at the end of, actually was in the middle of 2018, but didn't take office until the beginning of this year, was the government of of Mexico under Andres Manuel López Obrador, uh, which is you know a def definitely center-left government, and that was something very new. And those are that was a very particular situation which one have to, would have to look at. Uh, and then there's one outlier, which is Costa Rica, because that was no real change. It had always been relatively progressive and uh, social democratic, and so we can kind of leave it out as an exception. <laughs> So let's break down uh, the first trend that you mentioned, where you said that there have been conservative and right-wing successes in several countries that are actually consolidating the gains that they've made over several years. Can you explain why they're basically enjoying such success with the electorate? Yeah, I mean, this, it varies, of course, always from country to country, but I do think there's some general trends that we can look at. And uh, there's, like I said, three uh, main governments, three governments where they actually changed hands from more progressive or center-left governments to the right. And um, in each one of these cases, uh, one can actually point to a particular trend. Well, I first should mention which countries are they. So there were El Salvador with elections in February of 2019. They elected Nayib Bukele. We didn't really know who he was, but he turns out now to be really a very extreme right figure okay. in El Salvador. Then we had Uruguay, very recently the election, which um, just barely got elected a right-winger uh, in that country, but just by like uh, less than a 1% margin uh, in a runoff That's a slim vote. margin. And then, uh, then there was the election in Bolivia, which was kind of a special case, and I'll have to analyze that in greater detail, because actually the left, Evo Morales, did win that election, I would say, despite what, uh, a, lot of, uh, what a lot of others are saying about what happened there. And we need to take that apart very briefly, which can't go into great detail, but in other um, uh, you know, st of our stories, we have done that. 
So, but the overall trend, why these switches, these transitions from center left to right were possible, I would say, is that there was a more generalized economic downturn in Latin America in this period. So there was an economic slowdown. It wasn't actually uh, a recession or anything like that, but uh, all three of these countries had enjoyed relative economic successes and people came to expect that. And all of a sudden uh, that uh, the, the economic progress in these countries started to slow down. And this is particularly the case actually for Uruguay and Bolivia. And so that uh, kind of uh, turned people against them. That's one general overarching trend. Now, again, each country is specific in its details. Um, but another trend that I think applies to all three countries is that the center left or the left had been in government for a relatively long time already. So they kind of exhausted themselves to a certain extent. Uh, that is, corruption became a little bit more of a problem. Uh, and uh, for example, in El Salvador, the government of the FMLN had been in office for 10 years. In Uruguay, it had been 15 years. And Evo Morales had been in government also for 15 years, so, which is a very long time. And, um, and so in that time, you could see basically a sort of speak uh, exhaustion. Now, these three governments really added on, or like I said, there were already uh, something like uh, 12 other, uh, no, f uh, 13 other governments in the region that you could call conservative. So let me just briefly give a quick uh, idea as to what, uh, what's going on in terms of, and why that's reinforcing the existing trend. That is, uh, the main ones that had already uh, been conservative, we all know about Brazil under Jair Bolsonaro, which is this extreme yes. right government, which was elected in October of 2018. Then in Ecuador, it's kind of a, also a little bit of a special case, but uh, because it was elected as a progressive government, which then under the same president, uh, made a 180 degree turn and became conservative, started trying to implement neoliberal wow. reforms uh, on his own, basically betraying his, uh, his, uh, his uh, protege, uh, sorry, his mentor, mm -hmm. which was Rafael Correa. And then uh, in Paraguay, uh, had been conservative ever since the coup uh, that had uh, taken place in 2012. And then uh, in Honduras, uh, also had been conservative ever since the coup in, in 2009. And then you also have the government of Haiti, which is also, ever since the whole, uh, the coups against uh, Aristide, have been also quite conservative governments. So, um, so those are uh, five countries that had been uh, basically in office already as a result of essentially, you could say, either illegal or legal coups of one sort or another. Um, and then you had uh, ones where you always had conservative uh, governments, which is basically Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Guatemala. Chile is a little bit of an exceptional case because it had also had social democratic governments, but they always tended to be relatively conservative. So, the, so those those are kind of the overall, how should I say, the, the the foundation on which these new governments turned right. These three new ones in uh, in uh, Uruguay, El Salvador, and Bolivia. And as I said, well, which we will go maybe in a little bit more detail in. Uh, in about Bolivia, but I just want to mention it because it is a special case that we have to look at in great detail. But then, there, of course, there's the ones, the governments that uh, that uh, continued basically on a left kind of trajectory, which is Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba. And we always actually, for those of us who are observing Latin America, thought Bolivia would be part of that, and we're kind of surprised when that, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, when that coup happened in Bolivia in November. But uh, Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, and Cuba continue to hang on, and that's also something one would have to look at exactly why. Uh, but I would argue, actually, that U.S. interventionism, despite the efforts to overthrow them, is one of the reasons they're actually still in office, um, because it really hardened their positions and, and made them uh, more determined to hang on, so to speak, uh, uh, despite uh, you know, opposition movements within their countries. Now, the other movement that you described was popular uprisings pushing against neoliberalism. And I think you mentioned uh, Chile and Colombia being some of the countries that were pushing back. Why are we seeing this right now? Yeah, so the, the main ones really are Chile and Colombia definitely, and I would add to that also Ecuador and Haiti. Those are the four countries where you had uh, large movements uh, in opposition to the government and particularly against their neoliberal policies. And um, one could say that these, uh, these are, like I said before, these aren't completely new, but they're new for 2019. And they, and they fit within a larger worldwide pattern that we've seen uh, in many other places around the world. I mean, we've, we've also talked about the protest movements that, that, for example, just recently the strikes and that took place in France, and then also um, in various parts, uh, parts of uh, the Middle East, particularly Lebanon. Uh, so, the, so, and then, well, Hong Kong is perhaps a different case. But, but these are, um, 
uh, it's things that have been going on throughout the world. And of course, the main reason, and this is something that everybody, uh, all analysts usually point to, is that neoliberalism provokes a reaction because it makes life insecure for people and it makes uh, life more difficult for people. And, uh, and they're basically losing uh, social uh, uh, benefits of various kinds that they've been, come to depend on. Um, of course, you know, sometimes, of course, they go to the streets in order to uh, claim them in the first place. But in this case, uh, they're being taken taken away. Um, the taxes might be increased. I mean, for, next, for example, in Ecuador, uh, there was a gasoline tax that was introduced that uh, particularly affected the working class. And then in Chile, there was a, you know, a, a labor reform and a pension reform, uh, and also university reform that people rejected, uh, privatization. And uh, in Colombia, same thing, actually, pretty much similar, an education uh, process that, uh, that uh, wasn't moving forward, that, that the government had proce uh, promised and uh, wasn't, the, the money wasn't being provided to the university, so it was very largely student-led. Uh, and Haiti is a little bit more complicated, uh, but it also is a right-wing government that had been introducing neoliberal reforms to, those, uh, to that country. So, so these are things that, uh, that, uh, that they, they definitely have in common. Uh, and uh, this also goes along with a wave of repression against these governments. And that's one of the other kind of hallmarks of neoliberalism in Latin America and all again, probably all around the world, is that um, it, the neoliberal policies of privatization, of austerity, of right. uh, cutbacks is accompanied with protests, which is then accompanied with repression against those protests. And so that's basically that the sense. pattern. Uh, and that was really firmly established in 2019. That's actually really interesting that you said that because neoliberal policies in the United States, there is always a wealthy class that is benefiting from them and is able to push them forward despite you know, you know popular sentiment against them. So it's interesting that in South America they've actually successfully pushed back. That, yeah, that's actually a very important point that I forgot to mention. Exactly that they were successful uh, in every case. Um, well, the Haiti case is still unresolved. The protests are actually continuing uh, as we speak, um, and they might continue for a while longer. In Colombia, Chile, and Ecuador, though, the governments was forced to retreat and to say that they are going to uh, withdraw the reforms and negotiate with the opposition about them. Now, there's another trend you identified, which is a pushback against left and center-left governments, and I think you pointed them out in Bolivia and Venezuela. So how is it different? Like, how do they compare and contrast in those two countries? What does that pushback look like for them? Yeah. I mean, of course, the cases are somewhat different, um, particularly if we look comparing Venezuela and Bolivia, um, because Venezuela has gone through a very severe economic crisis, which uh, wasn't at all the case with Bolivia. I mentioned earlier that Bolivia did go through an economic downturn, but it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't actually even a recession. It was just a slowing down of the growth rate. And um, so it was a very different situation compared to Venezuela in that sense. Uh, but um, in both countries, you had uh, a very large, um, uh, well, a sizable middle class, really, that was uh, uh, opposed to these governments that finally, that mobilized with the support of the U.S. government, really, uh, in opposition to these countries. Actually, another one country where it happened earlier is Nicaragua in, 2000, uh, in spring of 2018, uh, which was followed a similar pattern in that. Now, that's not to say that these governments themselves didn't do things that might have provoked these protests. Um, they certainly did. I would say they've made certain mistakes. In the case of Venezuela, I would say that the economic policy uh, contributed to the recession. It wasn't just the, the sanctions. Although I think uh, the sanctions do, uh, exacerbated the problems, uh, exacerbated Absolutely. and actually you could say that they uh, made uh, uh, the, the problem, the economic problems, uh, far far worse than they otherwise would have been. Uh, in the case of Bolivia, it wasn't so much economic. The government actually followed a very sensible economic policy that was praised even by the IMF, uh, which is unusual and surprising. But they basically praised the lowering of the uh, of the poverty rate in Bolivia. Uh, and in Nicaragua was also economically speaking doing relatively decent, decently and not not so great, but wasn't uh, wasn't having major problems. Uh, so there, I would say in Bolivia and Nicaragua, you know, it definitely wasn't the economic issues. Uh, in Bolivia, it was also the that is in terms of what the government itself did it had to do with the um, uh, running for with Evo Morales deciding to run for a national, another term in office, even though there had been a referendum uh, that narrowly uh, rejected a um, an, an elimination of the term limits, and so I would say that some part of the opposition probably uh, definitely rejected that part of Evo Morales. But the rest of it, the, if you look at the the other thing that they have in common is if you look at the class basis of the protests, like I said before, 
see. You can tell very clearly that the middle classes are the ones who are protesting, uh, middle and upper classes, are protesting against these governments in Bolivia, uh, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, whereas the working class still, to a large extent, supported these governments. Now, there's this isn't uniform. I'm just saying this right. is uh, the general trend. Uh, there's certainly also you know, far left split offs of the governments and uh, of, of, the, of the political party system that join the opposition and so on. Uh, but uh, as a general trend, I think you could say this. This also happened earlier, I should point this out, under Brazil, in Brazil in 2016, under Dilma Rousseff, there was also this middle class movement against the government, which was also partly economic, but largely uh, political with U.S. support. And so these are the, those are kind of the patterns that we saw in the, in the kind of, for lack of a better term, conservative protest movements against progressive governments. Okay, so just, just to make sure that I understand correctly, we're seeing a pushback by middle class and upper middle class people against progressive, uh, progressive policies and progressive leftist governments. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, I would say that's in general, again, it's, only it's in very general, general terms, general terms, general uh, terms. because the, the situations and their details and the specifics are very different in various cases. But in, in the general sense, uh, I would say that's true, yes. I, now, you mentioned that the right experienced most of the gains, but it looked like in Argentina, Mexico, I think also Costa Rica, that there was some success for the left center and progressive uh, politics there. Why do you think they had that success? Why were they able to hold on to it? I think um, there's several different reasons, uh, but uh, one of them has to do with the opening of political space. Uh, that is, in both Argentina and Mexico, there were, had been, I mean, uh, in Mexico, it was really a constant push uh, on the part of uh, you know, the left uh, in Mexico for reforms in the electoral system and so on. Uh, and also, well, that was one part, in order to gain greater participation, to gain, gra gain greater um, you know, uh, uh, reliability in the electoral system. And um, then there was also, of course, the major split within the conservative forces uh, in, uh, in Mexico, which divided the... Uh, that's uh, their vote, basically, and made it possible for Andres Manuel López Obrador to win uh, that election, uh, actually quite solidly. Uh, in Argentina, is a, of course, it's a slightly different situation, but uh, there had been a, a progressive or center-left government under uh, Nestor Kirchner and then Cristina Fernández uh, Kirchner, his, his wife, um, and they had established, so to speak, a, a track record that, uh, that people basically wanted to return to after uh, Mauricio Marchi had been elected, who was a neoliberal and was introducing all these neoliberal reforms, and people just flat out rejected that. So it made it kind of, a, 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 a provided that knowledge, that uh, background, making it relatively, well, I wouldn't say easy, but definitely provided an opening for uh, Cristina Fernandez and Alberto as a vice presidential candidate, the ex-president became a vice presidential candidate, and the leader or the, the presidential candidate who won, who's taking office actually, very soon in December, uh, Alberto Fernandez. Um, they're not related, even though they have the same last name. But um, it made it possible for him uh, to 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 win that election. Costa Rica, as I mentioned earlier, is really an exception to all of the uh, everything that happens in Latin America, because it's been. Uh, I mean, one of the, and it's something surprising, I would say, that most other countries in Latin America don't learn from the Costa Rica example, because um, there's except for Haiti, actually. Um, and they're the only country in the in the Western Hemisphere that decided to abolish its military and to use that mil uh, the the military budget basically for social programs. Haiti did do that That's briefly amazing. under Aristide, um, but that, as we know, didn't go so well because of the coup. But um, Costa Rica was able to maintain that since the 1940s, uh, which is uh, the longest track record of any country in Latin America, and now has a government that has promised to become. Um, to implement basically a Green New Deal and to become carbon neutral, I think by 2030 or something like that. That's so they uh, set up a very ambitious goal and uh, it looks like they're on track to, to achieving it. So, but that's, like I said, a, a huge exception in Latin America. So what conclusions would you draw from the fact that all of these conservative and right-wing movements have really continued to have success? I mean, what can we look forward to in 2020 when we've seen that the conservative right has really consolidated their gains in Latin America? 
The main reason they've succeeded is, is through illegal uh, means. Now, I'm mm -hmm. speaking specifically of uh, many, now not 2019 so much, but specifically 2018, where they managed to take over, for example, in, in Brazil by marginalizing or by excluding uh, Lula da Silva as the presidential candidate. And there's plenty of evidence that this was done completely illegally, um, that uh, they didn't have a case for his corruption. As a matter of fact, now he's free after the election uh, <laughs> happened. He could have run for president if yeah. the case had followed a different um, you know, timing. Um, and uh, we can also then, uh, for example, and then the other examples are, uh, well, Ecuador, okay, was legal, but the president made a 180 degree turn and the people are basically betraying his voters. Um, then, uh, and then you've got the legacies of, of coup governments, such as in Paraguay, Honduras, and Haiti, um, which they themselves aren't necessarily coup governments, but uh, they're building on coups that happened you know, several years earlier. Um, and then you have the, the governments that have always been right-wing, uh, and specifically Colombia, Peru, and Guatemala, um, which are also legacies, actually, of coups that happened decades earlier, essentially, and never uh, opened up their electoral system for uh, real left participation. And it's especially the case in Colombia and Peru, because they always used the guerrilla war as an excuse for persecuting the left in those countries. And so that's why the left is extremely weak in, in Colombia and Peru. Uh, so those are kind of... Uh, uh, the, the main kind of reasons I think the right has been able to win is a combination of factors. The other major factor, of course, is the increasing uh, efforts on the part of the U.S. government to intervene in the, in the region. And uh, this, uh, this, like I said, hasn't been very successful, except for maybe in the case of Bolivia. And again, I, uh, I mean, the, the case of Bolivia is a, is a bit of a special case in the sense that um, that uh, what made the difference for the coup there was the participation of the military, unlike in Venezuela, where the military did not participate in overthrowing the government, even though the U.S. has been, and the opposition has been pushing for a coup uh, for, uh, well, definitely all of 2019, but us actually well before that. Um, and uh, they haven't made any gains in Venezuela because they don't have the military that is the, the opposition, and the U.S. government doesn't have the Venezuelan military on their side. Whereas in Bolivia, that wasn't the case. Particularly the police and the military decided to essentially oppose uh, Evo Morales, which is why he ended up uh, 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 seeing, uh, well, having to resign, essentially. Uh, he didn't really have much choice in the matter. Um, so those are, yeah, I guess some of the, the ways one can make sense of what's going on. So, Greg, help me wrap this up. What can we look forward to in 2020? What should we be looking for in Latin America? Mm. I think, uh, well, one of the things is, of course, in terms of the elections that are coming up. Actually, 2020 has very few elections compared to, let's say, 2018 or 2019. 2018 had six major elections, general elections. 2019 had only three. And there's actually only um, one presidential election next year, which is the one in Bolivia, um, which is under a coup government. So we'll have to, that's going to be the big story, I think, for us at least in 2020, is what's going to happen in March 2020 when the Bolivian presidential election is scheduled, which is taking, being organized essentially by a coup government. So the big question is, will it be a fair election? Will the opposition be allowed to participate uh, fully, which still has the largest uh, party, that is the movement towards socialism of Evo Morales, is still the largest party in the country and the most popular one. Um, the other elections that are happening in, in Latin America next year are parliamentary elections in late uh, 2020 in Venezuela, uh, then parliamentary elections in Peru, actually early of next year. And then you have something interesting, which is coming out of the protest movement, which is in Chile. Uh, they're going to hold a referendum on whether or not to rewrite the constitution, which was one of the main demands of the protesters. Oh. And so that'll be happening uh, actually several times next year. Uh, uh, that is first, to whether or not to they're have. They're going to rewrite their constitution? Yes. That was one of the main demands because it was a constitution that was written under uh, the dictator Augusto Pinochet and hadn't been really reformed since then. So th it's a, it's a right-wing constitution that makes uh, neoliberalism institutionalized in, in Chile. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's why people see it as being so important uh, to completely reform. So they're going to have a vote first on whether or not to 
have a new constitution, and then uh, who's going to be on it, and then whether or not to accept it. So that's uh, uh, that is who's going to be on the uh, constitutional assembly. And uh, the other things we can look forward to in terms of more general developments is, first of all, of course, more neoliberal policies with so many right-wing governments, and I think more protests and more repression. Now, those are going to continue, and I would say probably, uh, especially in Ecuador, Colombia, and Haiti, because there the situation really hasn't been resolved. Um, I mean, maybe in Chile as well, actually, the protests there are still continuing, uh, despite these concessions of the government. And uh, I would say add to that list actually Brazil and Honduras because uh, Brazil also uh, is going to face a reckoning sooner or later, I think, from the popular movements. And then finally, um, I also think what we should be paying attention to is uh, how is the U.S. government going to react, uh, particularly with regard to Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. The Trump administration keeps... Uh, mentioning that they still want to get rid of these governments, that they still want regime, cha regime change. And the big question is, you know, uh, what is it going to cost in terms of uh, lives lost and in terms of the suffering? Because the sanctions that uh, the United States has imposed on these countries, and particularly Venezuela and Cuba, but now also in Nicaragua, uh, are also causing a lot of suffering. Although I should mention very at very end, there's a, some light of hope, I think, in, in the case of Venezuela, in the sense that the economy seems to be recovering a little bit this, uh, recently. The Wall Street nice. Journal just had an article about it. And, um, and the uh, Venezuelan government and the more moderate opposition are coming to an agreement, particularly in the lead up to the uh, parliamentary elections. So that uh, would provide a real alternative, especially if they manage to make inroads in the political system and to establish themselves as a real alternative to the hard right, far right that the U.S. government is supporting. Well, that actually is a lot to look forward to. You're going to have to keep me updated and better educated on what's happening in Latin America. Thank you, Greg. My pleasure. My name is Teo Graham, and I'm your host for This Year in Review on Latin America. Thank you for spending time with me here on The Real News Network. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on our videos.